Here is the recap of the first six seasons of American Horror Story. Over the past few years, the Harmon family has had a lot of bad things happen, including Vivian's miscarriage and Ben's infidelity. So the heroes decide to move to another town and start over. The realtor shows the family a beautiful house, about which the locals have made creepy legends. It turns out that the previous owners died within the walls of the mansion, but it is this news that bribes their daughter Violet. In addition, the price of the mansion is significantly lower than other houses in the area, so the heroes decide to settle here. However, they do not suspect that the building is haunted. While Vivienne is busy settling in, an uninvited guest Constance and her daughter come to her house. The girl scares the heroine with words about her imminent death. The strangeness of the locals does not end there, and soon Vivian meets an elderly woman, Moira. The stranger appears to her as a maid, who, as it turned out, worked in this house under the previous owners. Vivian decides to hire her, thus surprising Ben, because he sees her not as an old woman, but as a sexy housekeeper. Meanwhile, the head of the family arranges one of the rooms into a working office, where he receives his clients. So he gets a young guy named Tate, he has an obsessive mania to kill people, with which he tries to fight, but without success. Ben helps him to restore his mental health, but noticing that he has become friends with his daughter, he decides to stop psychotherapy sessions. A couple of days after the movie, Ben tries to get closer to his wife, but Vivienne has not yet forgiven him for cheating, so they quarrel. In the end, the heroes do indulge in passion, and soon a man in a latex suit enters the bedroom, the heroine thinks that her husband thus wants to make a variety in their intimate life. So, without a backward thought, gives in to the impulse. A short time later, Vivian learns that she is pregnant. The next day, Ben gets a call from his lover, Hayden asking him to come to Boston to help her with the abortion. Realizing that he can't tell his wife the truth, Ben lies to Vivian about the difficult patient and leaves. At this time, the house is infiltrated by several people who want to repeat the bloody murder that took place within the walls of the mansion decades ago. Tate, along with the ghosts of the house, helps Vivian and Violet escape and kills the criminals. After what happened, Vivian wants to sell the house, but in order to dispel the creepy legends about the mansion and attract buyers, the heroine decides to delve into the history of the house and go on a tour. It turns out that the first owners were Dr. Charles and his wife, Nora. At some point, they stopped having enough money. Then the woman took the situation into her own hands and found an illegal way to earn money. She would find pregnant girls who wanted to get rid of their babies. Charles gave them what they wanted, and all was well until one of the patients blabbed to her boyfriend. After learning of the baby's death, the man decided to steal Charles and Nora's baby. But despite the expectations of the inconsolable parents, he never demanded a ransom. The kidnapper dismembered the baby, and his remains were brought to the parents by police officers for identification. Meanwhile, Tate takes Violet to the basement and tells her about the monster that lives in the place. It turns out that the first owner of the house, Charles, could not accept the death of the child and collected him in pieces, sewing him animal body parts. But the wife did not appreciate his work because the child fed on blood. As a result, Nora shot her husband in the head and then committed suicide. While Vivienne was on a tour, Hayden came to Ben's house. It turns out that the girl did not have an abortion and from now on is ready to do anything to keep Ben with her. Hoping to talk in a more private place, the heroes arrange a meeting. But at the appointed time, Ben does not come. So furious, Hayden once again breaks into his house. She wants to tell Vivian about everything. But then Larry, who was one of the former owners of the mansion, comes to her aid. He kills Hayden and buries her body in the ground, where Moira's corpse already lies. Larry tells the hero that he took care of his lover. And to hide the evidence, Ben has to put a gazebo at the burial site. To sell a house that everyone in the neighborhood thinks is cursed, the family hires interior designers. Soon, Chad and Patrick come to visit them. In fact, they are also ghosts who were killed in the past by a mysterious man in latex. But Vivienne and Ben don't know this yet. Soon, the couple is sent to the hospital for an ultrasound. 
It turns out that the child of the heroes is much larger than it should be at her gestational age. In addition, on the monitor of the device, the midwife sees something terrible and faints. On Halloween, Tate asks Violet out on a date, and the couple goes to the beach, where they are found by several bloody teenagers who blame Tate for their deaths. The girl doesn't pay much attention to their appearance because it's Halloween, and at this time, everyone dresses up as monsters. However, at some point she begins to think about their words and decides to check the story told by the guys from the beach. It turns out that many years ago, Tate shot over 10 high school students, after which the police killed him. That's how she finds out that her boyfriend is a ghost. Constance, who turns out to be Tate's mother, invites a psychic for Violet. She explains to the girl that Tate does not know about his death. Because of unfinished business in this world, he cannot pass to the afterlife, so he needs her support. Violet tries to process what she heard, but soon she begins to be tormented by other ghosts of the house. Unable to fight anymore, the heroine takes a vial of pills and falls asleep. However, she is found by Tate and brought to her senses. Meanwhile, Vivienne sees Hayden in the house and tells her about the pregnancy. When Hayden learns the truth, she decides to kill her lover's wife. But Ben shows up. He still does not realize that the house is haunted and thinks that Larry lied to him about Hayden's death. The situation forces him to confess to his wife that his lover was pregnant by him. In addition, it turns out that even after Vivian found out about his infidelity, Ben and Hayden's affair did not end. A potential buyer, Joe finally shows up and is interested in purchasing the spooky house. In addition, he likes Moira, who, as a maid, comes with the mansion. He, like the other men, sees her not as an old lady, but as an attractive young woman in a provocative uniform. It soon becomes clear that he does not intend to live in the house, but wants to tear it down for construction, which Constance learns about. The woman cannot allow this, because then all the ghosts of the house will be destroyed and she will no longer see her son Tate. So Constance persuades Moira to help her. Despite the fact that many years ago, it was she who killed her with a shot in the head for jealousy of her husband, the ghost girl agrees to help her and kills the potential buyer. The truth about the man in black latex is finally revealed. It turns out that in the past, Chad wanted to rekindle the passion in his relationship with his husband, which is why he once bought the suit which Tate soon used. He killed the couple and promised Nora, who was distraught over the loss of her baby, to get her a toddler, which is why he used Vivian. Meanwhile, Hayden conspires with Nora to finally drive Vivian crazy. The plan works, and Ben thinks his wife is insane, after which he has her committed to a mental institution. After some time, when Moira once again tried to seduce the hero, he finally had an insight and saw her in the form of an elderly lady. Soon, he learns from the doctor that Vivienne is pregnant with twins, and one of the babies is not conceived by him. Then he begins to figure out that everything his wife has said is true, which means that she is not crazy. Soon, Ben learns that Violet has not shown up at school for more than two weeks and decides to talk to his daughter. He thinks that the recent events have affected her psyche so she has fallen into a depressive state and does not go anywhere. However, in fact, everything is more complicated. It turns out that Violet died that day when Tate tried to save her from an overdose. The news of her death was not easy for the girl, because now she is forever tied to this house. Soon, Ben learns that the man in latex is Tate and takes his wife away from the asylum. The couple return home for Violet to relocate together but Vivian goes into labor in the car, so she has to go into the mansion. There is no time to call an ambulance, so all the ghosts, including Dr. Charles and the nurses, deliver the heroine's baby. However, one of the babies dies and the second child is carried off by Constance. After giving birth to the babies, Vivian loses a lot of blood and eventually dies. Violet realizes that the former owner of the house wants to take the baby away from her mother, so she tries to exorcise his spirit with the help of a ritual from a medium. However, the plan does not work, and instead, the girl learns the truth about Tate, who raped her mother. The girl says goodbye to her boyfriend, as she will never be able to forgive him. 
Meanwhile, Ben is left alone with a toddler, to whom he is not even a father. He calls for the help of his late wife's sister and packs his things to leave home. But at some point, he realizes that he can't live without his family. He tries to commit suicide, but Vivian's ghost appears and dissuades him. It would seem that she managed to convince her husband to leave the place with the baby. However, soon Ben is killed by Hayden, and the baby is stolen by Constance. After a while, a realtor shows the house to another family who, like the Harmons, decide to buy the mansion for its personality and low price. Vivian and Ben see all of this, so they decide to give them a brief tour of the haunted world on their first night to get them out of the house forever. Several years pass. Constance returns home where her son, to whom she is essentially a grandmother, is waiting for her. The woman finds the nanny on the floor with her throat slit and the child sitting next to her. This is the end of first season. The action unfolds in the insane asylum Briar Cliff, where a reporter, Lana, arrives. The girl asks the manager of the clinic, Sister Jude, to give her the opportunity to interview one of the patients. It turns out that for some time in the city, was running a serial killer who killed women and skinned them. He was nicknamed Bloody Face and was sent to an asylum after his capture. Not wanting to publicize all the horrors that happened to people in the walls of the hospital, Jude refuses the annoying reporter, but she still finds a way to illegally enter the building. As a result of examining the cell, the girl is attacked, after which she comes to her senses and realizes that she has turned from a visitor into a patient. Meanwhile, a married couple who are concerned about their son's behavior come to the asylum for help. They are sure that something terrible is happening to him and the only hope for salvation is faith and therapy. The clinic workers examine the young man and realize that the boy is possessed by a demon. When the exorcist tries to exorcise the dark powers, the demon moves into a nun named Mary, Jude's assistant. Meanwhile, a guy named Kit, whom everyone believes to be bloody face, meets Grace at the clinic. The girl believes in his innocence and assures him that she herself was in the clinic by mistake. Now, Kit has two options. Either he will be recognized as mentally unhealthy and will spend the rest of his days in the asylum, or the psychiatrist will recognize him as sane, and then the court will sentence him to death in the electric chair. To determine Kit's fate, psychiatrist Oliver arrives at the clinic, who is also attracted to Lana's story. The man agrees to visit her girlfriend and send her a message, but the girl was not at home, which means that no one will help Lana. Grace and Kit want to escape and Lana is ready to help, but only on the condition that Bloody Face does not leave the hospital. She thwarts one rescue attempt because Grace wanted to leave with Kit, but the second time the reporter began to doubt the guy's guilt. In the end, the trio waited until all the patients and staff start watching the movie in the common room and tried to escape. The nymphomaniac girl agreed to distract the guard, but soon she is caught by a local doctor, Arden. He is disgusted by the very fact of her existence, so without remorse, the man puts her monstrous experiments. At this time, the trio manages to go outside, but near the clinic, they are attacked by humanoid monsters, forcing the protagonists back into the building. A new patient appears at the clinic, who introduces herself as Anne Frank. She believes herself to be the very martyr who managed to survive in German captivity. At the doctor's rounds, the girl recognizes Dr. Arden as a Nazi who performed horrible experiments on everyone who fell into his hands. Jude is interested in the girl's story because she has long disliked Arden and his methods of work. The woman decides to seek help from a private detective, hoping that he will be able to find out the truth. After a while, Anna is picked up by her husband, who dispels Jude's suspicions and takes the mentally unstable wife home. Before cancelling her request to the detective, the woman goes to Arden's lab to check her hunches and find some clues. Except she had no idea that her assistant Mary had already removed all the evidence of Arden's guilt in the form of a mutilated nymphomaniac. Jude calls the detective to cancel her request, but ends up finding out that Anna was right. Arden was indeed a Nazi doctor who performed monstrous experiments on humans under the pretext of medical breakthroughs. Jude wants to share his suspicions with Monsignor, the director of the clinic, but he doesn't know yet that Arden is conducting experiments on living people with his consent. As a result, Jude is fired from the asylum. 
Meanwhile, Oliver helps Lana to escape and brings her to his house. After a while, the girl begins to realize that something is wrong with him, and soon her fears come true. It turns out that Oliver is actually the bloody face. The killer locks her in the basement along with the corpse of her girlfriend. Soon he receives a call from Kit, whom he tricked into making a tape recording of the confessions to those horrific murders. Kit demands that Oliver explain everything to the police. After all, because of that tape, he was taken to prison and now he is waiting for the death penalty. Enraged by Kit's rude behavior, Oliver returns to Lana and rapes her. After what happened, the killer realizes that he still has to deal with his captive. But the reporter manages to beat him and escape from imprisonment. She runs out on the highway and gets into the first car, but even here a man with an obvious mental disorder is behind the wheel. Eventually he shoots himself in the head and the car is involved in an accident. When Lana wakes up, she realizes with horror that she is once again in an asylum. Kit talks to the investigator and realizes that he will not be able to avoid execution. Then he decides to escape and returns to the asylum to visit Grace. But in time for the lovers to meet, a monster from the forest appears and attacks them, and the guard sees Kit killing the creature. He ends up shooting the protagonist, but Grace covers him with her body and dies. Meanwhile, Arden comes to Jude and asks for her help in fighting the possessed Mary. The woman believes the doctor's words and, on his tip, falls into a trap. As it turns out, Mary instigated one of the patients to take revenge on Jude and locked the two of them in the same room. In an attempt to defend herself, the sister kills the patient and the Monzinor locks her in the asylum as a patient. The next day, Mary uses electroshock therapy on her former boss, after which the woman gradually begins to lose her mind. At this time, Arden tries to get rid of Grace's body, but a sudden flash of bright light, which Kit once told him about, blinds the man, and when he regains consciousness, Grace's body is gone. Arden suggests that Kit's version about aliens is possible, so, having analyzed past experiences, guesses that the appearance of an alien race is somehow related to the threat to Kit's life. He offers the guy to experimentally test his theory, but to do so he will have to kill him for a while. Kit agrees, and after the procedure asks if he got to know the truth. But in response, Arden lies to him about the absence of any changes. In fact, while the guy was dead, there was another flash of light in the next room after which Grace, nine months pregnant, appeared. Oliver learns that Lana is back in the asylum and visits her. He wants to kill her, but the girl has a trump card. It turns out that she is pregnant by him. The reporter decides to take advantage of her situation and with the help of Keith brings Oliver out into the open by taping his confession to the murders. Then she tries to induce a miscarriage with a hanger, but her plan fails and the pregnancy persists. Monsignor begins to guess that Mary is really inhabited by a demon, so he asks Jude for advice, who is sure that the only way to get rid of the devil is to kill Mary. Monsignor throws the girl down from the third floor, and Dr. Arden, who has long had feelings for her, decides to burn with her in the cremation chamber. While Jude has not yet lost her mind, she asks one of the nuns to help Lana leave the clinic, and the woman agrees. She dresses the girl and leads her out of the building. Soon Lana visits Oliver's house and kills him, after which she takes the tape of his confession to the police and Kit is declared innocent. Lana begins to write books in which she describes her experiences in the asylum and Kit begs the Monsignor to give him Grace's death certificate, thus letting her go home with him. The protagonists, along with the baby, return to Kit's house, where they want to start all over again. But there, as it turns out, lives his wife and child who was once abducted by aliens. Kit with his wife, Grace and two toddlers live in the same house. Grace believes that the aliens who gave them the babies are sure to return because they are destined for a great mission. Except that Kit's wife is not waiting for this moment and with horror imagines the consequences. One day she attacks Grace with an axe, after which she falls into the hospital Bria Cliff, where she soon dies. Sometime later, Kit meets Lana at the presentation of her next book. He doesn't understand why after all this time she still hasn't closed the asylum. As a result, the guy learns that she is not going to do anything. However, after a while, the woman does return to the treatment center with an exposing report and tries to find Jude, but instead finds records of a certain woman who was given into Kit's care. 
The woman meets up with a buddy and learns that after that conversation at the cafe, Kit took Jude into his home. He realized that in order to move on, he needed to accept his past and forgive this woman. He eventually brought her into his home and introduced her to his children as a nanny, and six months later she died. Some time later, Kit got married again, but soon he got cancer and inexplicably disappeared right in his clinic room. Forty years pass. Lana has become a famous and rich elderly woman, to whom reporters came to record an exclusive for a TV program. During the interview, the protagonist talks about the Oliver child, whom she abandoned while still in the maternity hospital. For a long time, she worried that she gave the baby to strangers, but she could not raise a son from a brutal killer. A few years later, Lana wanted to see the child and met him on the playground. Since then, she never saw him again. From time to time, she wondered who the boy she abandoned 40 years ago had become. When the reporters and camera crew left, Lena's son showed up. It turns out that when he was young, he learned that she was his mother and Bloody Face was his biological father. Since then, he grew up hating Lana and admiring his deceased relative. Furthermore, he has begun to copy his crimes by killing everyone who enters the abandoned Briarcliff Asylum. The man pulls out a gun, hoping to kill Lana, but the woman shoots first. This is the end of the second season. In the 19th century lived Madame Lalari, who was known for her cruelty and torture of black slaves. She had a torture room in her attic, where she scalped them and turned one of her servants, who slept with her daughter, into a kind of minotaur. This continued for many years, but one day Madame Laveau knocked on her door. The stranger tricked the slave owner to drink the elixir, which eventually gave Lori immortality. But the woman was not acting in good faith. It turns out that Lallery turned her beloved into an animal and abused him every day, so the offended woman decided to take revenge on her in a rather unusual way. As a result, together with the townspeople, Madame Laveau buried Lalori alive, thus condemning the immortal human to eternal suffering. In the present day, young Zoe decides to take advantage of her parents' absence and calls her boyfriend to her house. The lovers decide to get close, but right during carnal pleasures her boyfriend dies. So Zoe learns that she is a witch and will kill anyone who sleeps with her. So her worried mother sends her to a special academy for special girls under the patronage of Cordelia. Within the walls of the academy, Zoe meets three students, movie star Madison, Nan and voodooist Queenie. Soon, together with the movie, Diva Zoe goes to a party where she meets Kyle. At the same time, his buddies drugged and raped Madison, and after the appearance of Kyle, they ran away. But boys can't get far, because Madison turns their bus upside down with the help of magic and the Y die. The instigator of the violence survives, but Zoe decides to use her gift and kills him right in the hospital. In gratitude for revenge, Madison offers Zoe to resurrect Kyle and together the girls go to the morgue. They put the guy back together piece by piece, and after he awakens, they try to take him away with them. At this time, the witch Misty, who has a skill for raising the dead, shows up. She offers to look after Kyle for a while, and the girls agree. Meanwhile, Fiona, the mother of the head of the academy, Cordelia, is trying in vain to find a way to rejuvenate herself and regain her energy. She is a high witch who returns to the academy after many years of absence to help her daughter teach her students the basics of magic. Fiona takes her students on a tour of Madame Lallery's house, after which she learns from Nan that she can hear her voice. The high witch secretly digs up the coffin and learns of her immortality, which she herself desires. Meanwhile, Cordelia dreams of having a child, but cannot get pregnant. Then the girl turns to Madame Lavey for help, but she refuses to do her a favor. It turns out that the clans of Fionai and Laveau have been feuding for many years, and after threats from Cordelia's mother, the witch refuses to help her. Misty manages to heal Kyle's deep scars, and Zoe decides to take him to his grieving mother. However, after she leaves, the unexpected happens. The boy who was brought back to life by the witches not only doesn't talk, but also behaves aggressively. After his mother's harassment, Kyle kills the woman and escapes, and soon Zoe finds him. The girl decides to bring him to the academy to always keep an eye on him. She has trembling feelings for him, as he is the only one she can have intimacy with since he is essentially dead. 
Soon Madison begins to feel attracted to the guy as well, and the witches decide to share him for two. After a while, however, Fiona accidentally kills Madison and asks the butler to get rid of the body. A council of witches arrives at the academy to investigate Madison's disappearance. However, the Supreme Witch manages to outwit everyone and avoid punishment. After a while, Cordelia is attacked by an unknown man in a robe and pours acid on the girl. As a result, the witch loses her sight and Fiona sees this as an opportunity to get rid of the council and its leader Myrtle. As a result, she accuses her and burns her at the stake. However, the burnt corpse is found by Misty. She resurrects the witch and brings her to her house where they are attacked by a witch hunter. So Misty has to ask Cordelia for shelter. Meanwhile, Zoe decides to find out where Madison has gone and uses a Ouija board. But in the end, she gets in touch with the spirit of a murderer nicknamed Axman who was killed years ago by another coven. He clues Zoe in that her friend's body is upstairs and in exchange for the information asks for release. So the Zoe finds Madison's corpse and, with the help of Misty's gift, resurrects her friend. Cordelia loses her sight but gains the gift of clairvoyance in return. Touching Madison, she learns that it was Fiona who killed her. Together with the Coven, the Cordelia decides to execute her mother in order to appoint a worthy supreme witch. But the woman is warned about their plan by the butler. Meanwhile, the resurrected Myrtle considers Cordelia her daughter, so she wants to return her sight at any cost. She kills her colleagues and gives their eyes to Cordelia. Soon the already sighted witch is visited by her husband, who, as it turns out, is a hunter and is in alliance with Madame Laveau. However, the girl has learned of his treason, so from now on she wants nothing to do with him. Now that she can see again, the gift of clairvoyance is gone. Realizing that a fierce struggle for life is coming, she decides to return this power, so she pokes out her own eyes. Meanwhile, the witch hunters begin to raid and kill all of Levo's companions, thus forcing her to come to the home of her enemy, Fiona. This is how the Supreme learns the secret of her immortality. It turns out that many years ago, she made a deal with a powerful god who gave her youth and strength in return for the annual fulfillment of his request. So year after year, Laveau steals babies and sacrifices them. Fiona is not afraid of such a fate. So she also decides to make a deal, but at the last moment, it turns out that she has no soul and therefore she has nothing to offer in exchange for immortality. To beat the deity and keep the baby, Laveau and Fiona decide to sacrifice another innocent soul and drown Nan in the bathtub. Soon the witch hunters meet with the Supreme and Madame Laveau, who supposedly want to make peace. It turns out that it was they who poured acid on Cordelia so that the girl began to need her husband, the son of the chief hunter. However, the situation got out of control and the Cordelia learned about the dark past of her lover. During the meeting, the Axeman, on Fiona's orders, kills all the hunters. Meanwhile, the struggle for the title of Supreme Witch begins to take new turns. So Madison decides to get rid of her rival and lures Misty into a trap. She locks her in a coffin and bricked her up in the wall. However, after a while, the other girls manage to realize what really happened and free Misty. Soon Madame Lallery and Lavo die and go to their own hell where now a voodoo witch is tormenting Lalri and her children. At this point, a blood-covered axeman bursts into the academy and tries to kill the witches, but Cordelia realizes that he has her mother's blood on him. In the Maniac's flashbacks, she sees him kill Fiona after she wanted to leave him. The Coven ends up repeating the same old story and stabs the axeman to death, sealing him forever. Now that the Supreme is dead, the young apprentices will have to pass the Seven Wonders test after which the name of the new ruler will be revealed. Everyone manages to cope with telekinesis, but the journey to hell turns to death for Misty. At the next stage, the girls undergo transmutation. The witches fool around, as a result of which Zoe accidentally impales herself on a metal fence and dies. Cordelia asks Madison to resurrect her friend, but she refuses because she doesn't need a rival. Myrtle convinces Cordelia to take part in the battle for the title of High Witch. Otherwise, if Madison wins, she will be a much worse leader than Fiona was. Cordelia agrees and easily passes the divination stage, but Madison fails the test. The girl ends up threatening the Coven to tell the reporters everything, thus destroying every single one of them. 
She goes back to her room and starts parking, and at this time Kyle comes to her. The guy is angry as Madison refused to resurrect Zoe. In revenge for the death of his beloved, the guy kills the movie star while Cordelia manages to resurrect Zoe. Fiona's daughter becomes a supreme witch and her sight returns to her. The first thing after her appointment, Cordelia decides to tell the world the truth about the existence of witches. She gives interviews for television, urging young witches not to be afraid of their abilities and seek help from the coven. Myrtle is proud of her ward, but, not wanting to harm her, asks her once again to burn her at the stake. Cordelia resists her decision, but in the end is forced to listen to her and together with Queenie and Zoe burns Myrtle. In a few days, a long line of young talents lined up outside the academy who could now not hide their identity and coexist peacefully in the human world. The new Supreme is happy about such changes in society. She offers the heroines to become part of her council and the girls agree. Soon the head of the academy meets her mother, whom everyone thought was dead. Fiona tells her the truth about her plan, because now that the cancer is in its final stages, she has nothing to lose. It turns out that she implanted Axman with false memories of her death in order to deceive her daughter and everyone else. The plan was for her to sit in the shadows while the election for a new High Witch was underway, and at the moment when the title was already awarded, she would return and kill the new head of the clan, thus regaining her power and strength. However, things didn't go according to plan, as her own daughter became her successor. Not daring to kill Cordelia, Fiona dies and falls into her own hell with the Axemen. This is the end of the third season. If you've listened all the way up here, you like what I do. So subscribe to my channel, like this video and write some comments. Elsa founded her freak circus in Florida, but it was not very popular, and too few people came to the concerts. Then the woman decided to make changes in the program and found conjoined sisters Beth and Dot. The girls have one body, one pair of arms and legs, but two heads, hearts and spines. Elsa is convinced that the two-headed girls will be the highlight of her show, so she persuades them to join the troupe. Meanwhile, it turns out that they killed their own mother, so laying low in the freak circus would be a good idea. Soon they meet other freaks, the bearded woman Ethel, her claw-handed son Jimmy, and other guys. Time passes, and Elsa prepares a new program for the performance. But during the preparation, not everything turns out smoothly, because the new members of the troupe in the person of Dot and Beth want to get a special role in her show. After a while, a detective comes to their tent and calls them monsters showing his contempt for every person with congenital features and anomalies. Jimmy decides to stand up for the girls, but eventually the situation gets out of control and he kills the detective. Soon the local rich man Gloria and her son Dandy come to the show. The man looks at the freaks with delight and asks Elsa to sell him sisters. However, the woman refuses him and then the guy visits Jimmy trying to convince him to take him in the show. But even here, he receives a refusal and then falls into a rage, which decides to subdue his mother. It turns out that recently she met a clown who has been killing innocent people for several years. The woman doesn't know about it, but makes him something of a pet, who ends up running away from Dandy anyway. However, he finds him and learns about the clown's manic tendencies, after which he decides to join him and starts imitating the killer. Elsa is visited by a married couple, Dell and Desiree, who have a breast abnormality. The family asks to join the troupe, and Elsa agrees to take them in. In addition, it turns out that Dell is the biological father of Jimmy, but the guy himself does not know it yet. Many years ago, he had a relationship with Ethel. But when he saw claws instead of hands on his son, he wanted to kill him, but decided to just leave the family. Meanwhile, a couple of scammers, Stanley and Maggie, show up at one of the museums with exclusive exhibits. To be under the guise of a Yeti cub, they try to sell a goat embryo. But the museum keeper quickly reveals their fraud, but does not drive them away and offers them a deal. If they can find something really valuable, she won't ask too many questions and will pay them for their work. 
Then Stanley sends Maggie to Elsa's freak show to take new exhibits from there, killing circus performers. The plan works and the girl is taken into their troupe. Meanwhile, the conjoined sisters Beth and Dot offer to prepare another performance and play it on Halloween. But everything is not so simple because there is a legend about Mr. Mordrake. It turns out that this man lived in the last century and was quite talented, but had one feature that could not be accepted by the public. He had another face on the back of his head, which sometimes forced him to do terrible things. Mordrake tried to get rid of it in many ways, but all his attempts were in vain. Eventually, he joined the freak circus to take his place among his kind. But at one point, he killed the entire crew. Since then, there is a belief that whoever performs any role on Halloween will attract the spirit of Mordrake, who will kill them all. Soon Maggie asks Jimmy to take her to the nearest phone booth so that she can contact a relative and assure her safety. The boy agrees, but does not yet know that she is actually calling Stanley and reporting to him the situation in the circus. Returning home, the couple have to abandon their vehicle and hide in the woods. Because of the murders of the maniac in the city, a curfew has been imposed and the police are constantly patrolling the roads. Suddenly, they notice a clown dragging a girl into the woods and decide to help her, but end up getting trapped. Jimmy manages to create a distraction, and in the meantime, Maggie and the rest of the prisoners escape. Meanwhile, the circus did have a Halloween performance. Mr. Mordrake and the ghosts of his troupe show up at the freak show. He listens to the story of everyone he visits, trying to figure out the darkest soul and take it with him. That's how he finds Elsa, who tells him about her past. It turns out that a long time ago she was a prostitute who once had her legs cut off by customers with a chainsaw, in addition to filming the spectacle on camera. As a result, the video quickly spread, and with it her shame. She was rescued that day by one of her clients, who nursed her back to health for a long time and soon had prosthetic legs made. Mordrake finds her story horrific and at the command of the face in the back of his head. He is about to take her life, but at the last moment chooses another victim, so he ends up in the woods where the clown is holding Jimmy. The maniac tells his story, trying to explain how he became like this. He used to delight kids with his performances, but he had bad luck with his co-workers. One day they decided to make fun of him so much that in the end the clown tried to kill himself, but the bullet went through, disfiguring his face but saving his life. So he got the idea to free children from their parents, who were always telling them what to do. He ended up killing the children's relatives and taking the kids into the woods to perform. Mordrake decides that it is the clown, not Elsa, who should go with him today and kills him. Soon Maggie's sidekick, named Stanley, shows up and tells Elsa, that conjoined sisters would look good on his show in Hollywood. The woman doesn't show any sign of being upset, but soon decides to take Beth and Dot to Dandy, who has his eye on them. Meanwhile, she informs everyone else that the girls just took off and ran away. But Jimmy doesn't believe her and goes on a search, after which he returns the sisters to the troop. However, the girls protect Elsa, and in return ask her for a substantial sum of money, which should be enough for the operation to separate them. Elsa tells Stanley about a conversation with Beth and Dot, and the man suggests that she get rid of them. At this time, Ethel overhears them and decides to kill her longtime friend, but Elsa throws a knife at her and fakes side with a Stanley. Meanwhile, he learns that Dell has a non-standard orientation and threatens to tell the troop about everything. Fearing publicity, the man agrees to fulfill his request and kill some freak. The choice falls on the world's smallest woman. He steals her and chokes to death, after which her body is sent to a museum of deformities. After a while, Dandy kills his mother and goes in search of more victims. He bribes a local detective and puts Jimmy behind bars for his evil deeds. Soon Stanley comes to him and tells about a lawyer who can help him, but he will have to pay a huge sum. The guy has no money, but he has claws that can be sold profitably. 
Stanley offers him help in this difficult case, and the guy agrees. Meanwhile, Maggie begins to feel guilty because she fell in love with Jimmy, who was taken away by detectives. She decides to reveal the truth about her partner to Desiree and brings her to the museum where she sees the boyfriend's claws. That's how everyone finds out that Stanley has been lying to everyone, and eventually Jimmy does end up behind bars. Then the freaks come up with a plan to intercept and free the guy. However, now the Jimmy without two hands cannot take care of himself and rejects Maggie's help. Because of her, his buddies died. The troop presents Stanley with a gift in the form of the severed head of the museum keeper, after which they all attack and brutally torture him. However, the revenge does not end there, because the troop begin to realize that Ethel could not have killed herself and behind her death, most likely, is Elsa. Beth and Dot decide to give the last good advice to Elsa and ask her to leave as far away as possible. Which she does, but before leaving she sells the rights of ownership of the circus to the psychopath Dandy. The guy decides to make himself the highlight of the program, but when he finds out that no one buys tickets for his show, he gets mad. As a result, he takes a gun and kills almost all the freaks who get under his hand. Only Beth and Dottie doesn't dare to kill as he has tender feelings for them. In the end, he marries the sisters, unaware of their true intentions. It turns out that they slipped something into his drink, causing his mind to cloud. That's when Jimmy and Desiree show up. The trio grabs the psychopath and brings him back to the circus, having immersed Dandy in a large container of water. The protagonists watch his slow death. Meanwhile, Elsa arrives in Hollywood and miraculously meets a junior casting assistant. As a result, she marries him and her career takes off. Soon she is offered to perform on Halloween, which she flatly refuses to do because of the ghost of Mr. Mordrake, which, of course, she does not tell her superiors. But the challenges don't end there either. It turns out that her management has gotten access to one old video of her as a prostitute lying in pools of her own blood because of her severed legs. Not giving the video publicity will not work, which means her career is about to end. It also became known about the bloody massacre at the freak show circus she once headed. Elsa didn't know about it, so she was as surprised as anyone else, realizing that her glory days are numbered. The woman begins to think about missed opportunities and female happiness, from which she turned away because of the desire to become famous. Now that everything that was once dear to her is gone, the Elsa agrees to go on stage on Halloween. She takes this step consciously because she wants to summon Mr. Mordrake to kill her and take her with him. The plan works, but the ghost does not make her part of his dead troop, but sends her to her own circus. So Elsa returns home, where all her loved ones, including Ethel, hold no grudge against her. Meanwhile, survivor Desiree is married and happy with her lover. Jimmy lives with Beth and Dot, and soon there will be an addition to their family. This is the end of the season four. Detective John investigates a series of brutal murders. He finds naked lovers who were nailed to each other by a maniac, and the man's eyes and tongue were torn out. While the protagonist is trying to find at least some evidence, he receives a phone call from an unknown person who says that it was he who killed them and is now in the gloomy Hotel Cortez. The man immediately goes to the specified address, but in the room finds no one, and after a while he gets a vision of his son Holden, who disappeared a few years ago. Sometime later, John receives a message from his wife with an address where she asks him to come and help her, except that in the specified house, he does not find Alex, but sees only two disemboweled corpses. Realizing that he and his family are in danger, John decides to leave home for a while and settles in Cortez. Meanwhile, the Countess and her boyfriend Donovan find a couple in love and drag them to their room for a little fun. However, during foreplay, the protagonists kill their guests and drink their blood. Soon a new hotel owner named Will shows up, and the Countess takes his son to a secret room where young children live, including the kidnapped Holden, the detective's son. There, their blood is drained out of them. Meanwhile, John meets a local regular named Sally in the hotel lobby. 
Years ago, she was a drug addict who came to this hotel with Donovan. Then the guy died of an overdose, and his distraught mother Iris threw her out the window. Since then, she's been a ghost forced to spend eternity inside the hotel walls. John, of course, does not know the whole truth about Sally and sees her only as an acquaintance to whom he simply tells about his life over a glass of alcohol. The next day, Will holds a fashion show at the hotel, where model Tristan participates in one of the fashion shows. The Countess immediately spots him and soon decides to infect him with an ancient virus that runs in her blood as well. Now he is a vampire and her new boyfriend. Donovan does not like it because he is in love with his creator, but his mother Iris, who works at the front desk as administrator, is delighted with the news. John's daughter Scarlett also comes to the fashion show, and together with the new owner's son, she wanders around the hotel and finds glass coffins, in one of which her brother is sleeping. Not believing her eyes, the girl decides not to tell her parents yet, and the next day once again returns to Cortez. This time she manages to talk to Holden, but his behavior seems strange to her. Scarlett tells the happy news to her father and mother, but they think it is foolish because the boy disappeared many years ago and is unlikely to be alive. After a series of strange visions, John tries to find out about this place from Iris, who tells him the history of Cortez from the day it was founded. It turns out that in the mid-20th of the last century, local millionaire Mr. March decided to build a hotel. However, being a brutal killer, the man during the construction provided in the building a number of secret passages and secret rooms, as well as corridors that do not lead to the exit, so that the victim could not escape. Years later, police discovered Mr. March's handkerchief at one of the crime scenes and paid a visit to the hotel. Realizing that his evil deeds were about to be discovered, the millionaire decided to kill himself, and with him went out of life and his devoted maid, Miss Evers. Since then, spirits have been roaming the hotel and killing everyone who displeases them. John doesn't believe Iris's words, so he just leaves. Donovan once again rejects Mother Iris and declares that it would be better if she killed herself. The distraught woman shares her suffering with Sally and the girl agrees to help her part with her life. She injects her with some kind of substance, but at the last moment, her son comes running in and turns her into a vampire. Meanwhile, Alex comes to John and brings divorce papers. In the years they have been together, she has never been able to come to terms with the disappearance of her son, so she doesn't want to be together with her husband anymore. Before leaving the hotel, the protagonist sees Holden and immediately takes him home. But soon, she realizes that something is obviously wrong with the child. The fact is that he killed a pet and drank its blood. Alex returns to Cortez with her son and meets the Countess, who offers her the greatest gift of immortality in exchange for unconditional obedience. Since she has always had a special bond with Holden that she never had with John or Scarlet, Alex agrees and turns into a vampire. It's Devil's Night, where the greatest killers of the 20th century come together to celebrate their atrocities. So John finds himself invited to this celebration, where he sees the faces of all the killers who have been trumpeted in the news for decades. After small talk, ghosts of maniacs decided to kill another poor man, and at that moment, John passes out. When he wakes up, the protagonist sees the guest Sally in front of him, who assures him that nothing of the kind happened, and the dinner with the killers was a dream. Newly minted vampire, Alex decides to help a child Max, who is dying of measles, by turning him seconds before his death. However, the protagonist did not think what consequences her deed would have. The fact is that the recovered boy turned half of his class, and together with his friends, killed teachers and parents. Soon the children began to kill everyone who gets in their way, because the thirst for blood every day became stronger and stronger. After a while, the Countess finds out about it and gives Alex an ultimatum. Either she will deal with the children or the Countess will have to do it herself, but in this case, Alex will die too. Meanwhile, Iris is also trying to get used to her new state, but she has not yet come to the point of killing people. However, when a couple of arrogant hipsters move into the hotel, the main character's nerves give out. She kills the disgruntled tenants and feeds on their blood. Hotel barmaid Liz and Tristan fall in love with each other, but because of the Countess, they cannot be together. Liz decides to talk to her benefactress, but she kills Tristan for betraying her. Meanwhile, Will, as the new owner of the hotel, checks the layout of the building with the documentation and finds some discrepancies. As a result, 
The builders demolished the steel wall that was not taken into account, but they do not know yet that Valentino and Natasha were vampires hiding behind this wall. In 1925, the Countess met Valentino on the set of another movie, and between them immediately erupted passion. Together with Natasha couple often spent time together, but soon it became known that Valentino died. The Countess was hard to bear this news, and in order not to finally go crazy, decided to marry Mr. March, the creator of the hotel. Not that she did not prevent her husband from killing people, but on the contrary supported his craving for cruelty and bloodshed. After a while, the protagonist learned that Valentino purposely faked his death because he and Natasha acquired something priceless, immortality. So from now on, he could not appear on the screens because sooner or later people would notice that he does not age. Then the couple offered the Countess to leave with them, but at the appointed time, they never came. For a long time, the protagonist thought that she was abandoned and only now learned that her husband, Mr. March, simply walled them up in the hotel condemning them to eternal torment. At this time, John, who from now on is tormented by visions that have no rational explanation, continues to investigate a series of murders. Having analyzed each case, the protagonist guesses that someone kills people, choosing victims according to the principle of the Ten Commandments. To find out more, he specially lays down in a psychiatric hospital to find the alleged killer, but instead, he finds a girl rent. She informs the detective that the real killer has been living in Cortez all this time, and then she jumps in front of a car and dies on purpose. John returns to the hotel, where he is met by Sally, who takes the protagonist to a secret room built by Mr. March. John sees flasks inscribed with the Ten Commandments, each containing some sort of human organ. It turns out that John himself was the serial killer, and he doesn't remember it only because he suppresses his memories himself. Sally recounts the detective's first appearance at the hotel. The case was several years ago. Then he met the ghost of March, who, talking to him, realized that it was John who was worthy of becoming his follower and killing people. To push the protagonist to the first step, March incited the Countess to steal Holden, thus creating a deep wound on John's heart, which became the trigger for a series of murders. The Countess wants to reconnect with Valentino, but to do so, she needs to marry Will as soon as possible and kill him in order to inherit the hotel. The plan works, but here Donovan kills her lover Valentino. When the Countess comes to him to get even, Liz and Iris burst into the room, intending to kill the owner and start running the hotel on their own. Except that they can't kill the Countess because she is covered by Donovan, who soon dies. Now that the Countess has nothing to keep her in the hotel, she gathers her things and leaves. But in the elevator, she is met by John and killed as the last victim of the Ten Commandments. So the Countess becomes a ghost, forever imprisoned within the walls of the hotel, and Mr. March's ultimate dream of being reunited with his wife comes true. Now that they are both ghosts, the founder of the Cortez forgives his wife for turning him into the police that day. But it turns out that it wasn't her, but the devoted maid Miss Evers, who is desperate for his recognition. Now that Will and the Countess have become ghosts, the hotel is run by Iris and Liz. They are trying to do everything possible to make these walls again appear tenants, but only the ghosts of Sally and will constantly kill visitors. Then the main characters decide to hold a general meeting and convincingly ask the ghosts not to kill people anymore, because otherwise the hotel can be demolished and it is not known where the ghosts will go then. Iris gives Sally a phone and opens the world of social networks and virtual communication for her, and Liz helps Will to realize that even being dead, he can keep his business and increase his capital. The ideas of the main characters work, and no one else tries to kill visitors. After a while, Liz learns about cancer and realizes that very soon, she will die. Not wanting to part with her loved ones, she asks the ghosts of the hotel to kill her in order to stay in Cortez forever. They agree and the Countess kills Liz. Meanwhile, the ghost of Detective John, who psychic Billy Dean is looking for, appears in the hotel. In an interview, the man talks about how he died. It turns out that after he left the hotel with Holden and Alex, life became a little more complicated because they constantly needed blood to keep Scarlett safe. Her parents sent her to a good residential school. So, during one of the raids, when John was getting blood for his family, the police killed him. But since he did not die within the walls of the hotel, he could not remain the ghost of Cortez. Now only on the night of the devil he can appear here. 
to make sure the psychic doesn't show up at the hotel again. John brings her to dinner with the ghosts of serial killers, thus demonstrating a very real threat to her life, in case she does continue to search for answers. This is the end of the season five. Married couple Shelby and Matt are interviewed for a documentary TV show in which they recall all the horrors of life in the Roanoke house, and they are played in this documentary by other actors. It all started with a quiet evening when unknown people attacked Matt, because of which the man went to the hospital and Shelby had a nervous miscarriage. In an attempt to start from scratch, the main characters decide to move to another state, where they looked for a spacious house in the woods with a centuries-old history. On the purchase of the mansion claimed neighbors, so Matt had to offer almost double the amount so that the house still got them. Despite the change of environment, Shelby felt strange, and this house from the first moments began to scare her, but the girl did not dare to tell her husband about it. Soon, when Matt began to leave for work on business trips, Shelby began to see strange things. It all started with a rain of teeth, and then someone tried to drown her. Neither the first nor the second time the police did not believe the girl's stories, and her husband wrote everything off as stress after a failed pregnancy. The time comes for Matt to go on a business trip once again, only now he decided to prepare and installed cameras around the perimeter of the house, which he synchronized with his phone. Matt has also asked his sister Lee to come to their house and keep his wife company for the duration of his absence. Soon strange things start happening in the house again, but this time they are noticed by Lee, who is sure that Shelby is trying to attract attention to herself and convince Matt to leave the house. Lee hears strange noises and the girls head to the basement, where an old TV has a video on. The tape shows a person being confronted by a man with a pig's head. At this time, Matt sees a street camera video on his phone that clearly shows several people with torches entering a house. Being a hundred kilometers away from his loved ones, Matt rushes home at full speed, while Lee and Shelby come out of the basement and notice some kind of voodoo dolls hanging all over the house. When Matt arrives, no strangers are in the house anymore. However, when asked by Shelby to leave the house, Matt decides to reply that they need to fight and not let the neighbors intimidate them. Shelby ends up getting in her car and driving off alone, and soon runs over a woman in rags. Trying to make sure the victim doesn't need help, Shelby follows the stranger into the woods, where she stumbles upon dozens of people who are sacrificing some kind of human being. Trying to escape her pursuers, the girl runs out onto the road, where she is met by Lee. So Shelby gets to the hospital, but even this time the police do not believe her because they did not find anything in the clearing in the forest. The next day, Lee brings her daughter Flora into the house because after the divorce, the woman can very rarely see her. Soon the girl makes a friend Priscilla, whom none of the adults see. However, when the girl says that Priscilla asked to stop the bloodshed, otherwise all the inhabitants of the house will be killed, the mother has a little thought. Soon the woman's ex-husband Mason arrives, who upon hearing the story from now on forbids Lee from bringing their daughter to the house. Meanwhile, Shelby and Matt find something like a sacrificial cross in the woods, after which they manage to convince the police to put a guard on their house. During the night, Matt is suddenly awakened by a phone call from an elderly woman asking for his help. He turns his head and sees two nurses in his house who are abusing and killing an elderly patient. Matt calls a policeman, however, the policeman finds nothing. After a while, the married couple notice the silhouette of a girl in the yard and decide to follow her. So the main characters discover a cellar and in it a camera with a tape on which Dr. Elias, the past owner of the house, tells the story of this place. It turns out that he came here to write a book about two nurses who opened a nursing home in this mansion and killed pensioners but they were not the only evil dwelling in the walls of the house. Soon Lee appears on the doorstep, having snatched Flora from school and brought her to the house. Realizing that for these actions she can go to jail, Shelby calls Mason and asks him to understand the feelings of his ex-wife. As a result, the man rides out to see them. However, at this time it becomes known that the girl disappeared without a trace, and soon her sweater is found on a tall tree. The search begins, and after a while in the woods they find a charred body tied to a pole. 
the victim turned out to be not Flora, but her father, Mason. The tragedy does not give the spouses rest, and they decide to look at the cameras, from which they learn that Lee went out at night and was absent for four hours. Meanwhile, on the doorstep of the house appears Psychic Cricket, who conducts a spiritistic seance and learns about who threatens the family. It turns out that many years ago, there was a colony not far from here, which was headed by Thomasina's husband, but the man had to leave his tribe for a while, and his wife was ordered to wait for him in these lands. However, the supplies began to dwindle, so one day the colony decided to rebel against Thomasina and, putting an iron muzzle on her head, threw her into the forest to her certain death. However, there she met a forest witch and accepted a gift from her. Eventually, Thomasina returned to the colony and cruelly punished all those who were displeased with her rule. She then led her people to the place on which the couple's home now stood, and to make the land hers forever, she killed the entire colony, after which she sacrificed herself as well. Since then, the Rono colony has roamed these lands and killed all who trespass on them. Fortunately, Flora finds herself not with Thomasina, who is nicknamed the Butcher, but with the spirit of a little girl named Priscilla. Cricket agrees to help find the girl for $25,000 and Lee gives the go-ahead, and soon she is picked up by the police on suspicion of murdering her ex-husband. The next day, Shelby is attacked by a man with a pig's head, from which she is saved by Dr. Elias with a video from the cellar. From him, the protagonists learn about a pattern of deaths that only occurs when a blood moon appears in the sky. The doctor learns about Priscilla and helps the main characters find Flora, but during the negotiations, the butcher's men kill him and Flora escapes with the other spirits. Once close to home, the couple notices Psychic Cricket, who informs them that he knows how to help them. He goes to his home to get everything he needs, but on the highway he spots Flora and follows her into the woods. Meanwhile, the spirit of the forest witch lures Matt into the cellar, and a special intimate connection takes place between them, during which the man learns all her backstory, emotions, and feelings, but when he hears Shelby screaming, he still returns home. It turns out that at this time, the first settlers surrounded the house and in front of the main characters decided to kill Flora in order to pay tribute to the land, but Priscilla helps the girl to survive. However, the colony kills the psychic cricket instead of her, showing the survivors that they will be next. Thinking that all is lost, the main characters descend to the basement, where they see the spirit of the first owner of the house, Edward, who decides to help them and guides them through secret tunnels into the forest. However, in the forest they are found by a family of cannibals. It turns out that for many years they have an agreement with the butcher, according to which they supply her with people for sacrifice, and she does not attack them. So the cannibals take the family to the spirit of Thomasina, but on the way Matt manages to escape, and the main characters try to hide in the woods, but the mother cannibal finds them and breaks Shelby's leg. After that, she brings them to the house, where they are already waiting for the butcher. After a while, a car with Lee appears, and the couple and Floor manage to escape. This is how season one of my nightmare in Roanoke ended. Let me remind you, this is the show in which the actors played, and the real spouses Shelby and Matt look like this. In the future, for your convenience, I will call the actors as well as the characters they played. On the wave of success, producer Sydney decides to shoot the continuation of the show and call there as the actors who played roles in season one and the main characters from the real world. All the characters agreed to take part, but only the candidacy of the butcher, Sydney rejected as after the release of the show actress went a little crazy and too into the role of his screen character. During the preparation of the house for the next shooting team, Sydney began to notice certain oddities, but because of the high ratings producer decided not to pay attention to them. So the first person who died on the set of the second season was a man who played the first owner of the mansion. Then there is an angry actress who played the butcher appear. She kills Sydney and his assistants. Then she tries to intimidate the rest of the show, but meets the real slaughterer and dies. Soon the girls who decided to escape into the woods are caught by a family of cannibals, but they manage to escape. Meanwhile, in the mansion, Shelby catches Matt getting intimate with the forest witch and learns that he has fallen in love with her, 
and that's why he came back to the cursed house. Unable to contain her emotions, the girl crushes his skull and soon slits her own throat. After a while, another actor appears on the doorstep of the house, who having learned about what has happened, suggests leaving this place as soon as possible. On the way he is killed by cannibals, and the women have to flee. Meanwhile, three bloggers who are fanatical about the TV show arrive in the forest. They intend to find evidence of the existence of spirits in order to create good content and attract new subscribers, but in the meantime they meet Lee in the forest, who has made a deal with the forest witch, just like Thomasina once did. Lee kills one of the bloggers, forcing the others to hide in a wagon. Here they see on the cameras that only actresses Shelby and Lee are left in the house, and the real Lee is coming to kill them. The teens warn the actresses of the danger, but they are met outside the house by the spirits of the early settlers, who sacrifice the bloggers. Meanwhile, Lee sneaks into the house, kills her actress, and drives the second victim into the cellar, seriously injuring her. In the morning, the police arrive at the house and find dozens of dead bodies in a live Lee, after which the actress Shelby comes out. The girl, wanting revenge, snatches a gun from a policeman, thereby provoking the other cops to shoot her. Some time passes, and the court hearing on Lee's case begins, because according to Flora's statements, it was her mother who killed her father in the woods. However, the court decided not to consider her daughter's testimony, and Lee was acquitted. Soon the ghost hunters decide to go to Roanoke's house to find exclusive footage, but at this time in the house appears Lee, who has learned about the disappearance of her daughter. She hopes that she will be able to find her here, and uninvited guests are advised to leave the house as soon as possible. Hunters for the paranormal decide not to listen, for which they soon pay with their lives. And Lee does find Flora. It turns out that the girl wants to become a ghost to protect Priscilla from the butcher, but Lee does not want her daughter to lose her future and die, so she decides to sacrifice herself and become a mother to Priscilla hoping that one day Flora will be able to forgive her for killing her father. This is the end of the season six. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the like button. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.